Good afternoon and thank you for joining us online today. My name is Catherine. Um, I'm the Curatorial Assistant at UNSW Galleries. Today I am speaking to you from my home on beautiful Gadigal country. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that this always has been and always will be Aboriginal land and sovereignty has never been ceded. Today we're joined by Zoe Sadakirsky and Timo Rissanen, who will be discussing their collaborative design project, Precarious Birds. Um, Zoe is an award-winning book designer, writer, and is senior lecturer at UTS School of Design. She is part of Spec Studio, which is a collective of design researchers exploring narrative approaches to ecological communication. Timo is a researcher, educator, artist and designer working across fashion, art and sustainability. Um, his artistic practice focuses on labour, politics and love through installation and cross-stitch poetry. Um, this conversation is part of a suite of public programs um, held in conjunction with the exhibition to Companion a Companion, which is at UNSW Galleries until the 31st of July. Um, this project brings together new work by Argentinian Australian artist Fernando de Campo and proposes that maybe human is the companion species to birds. Um, alongside the exhibition, there's also a wonderful online reader um, that both Zoe and Timo have contributed to. Um, you can find it at companion, companionreader.com um, and I'll put that link in the chat as well. Um, please feel free to use the YouTube chat function throughout the talk. Um, to ask questions or leave comments, and then we'll leave some time at the end to answer them. Um, I might hand over to you now, Zoe and Timo. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's a shame we can't do this in person because of the lockdown, but I'm glad that we can continue online. Hey, thanks so much, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. Um, we would also like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal and Wongal people of the Eora Nation upon whose ancestral lands we uh, come to you from today. Uh, we pay our respects to elders past and present, acknowledging them as traditional custodians of knowledge for these lands. Um, we pay our respects to Aboriginal people joining today as well. Uh, and we'd also like to acknowledge the wider environments uh, which we live in and amongst and recognise that the decisions and actions that we make today, no matter how small, will have consequences now and into the future. Um, and at this point, I'm just going to awkwardly do the screen share thing, which hopefully I can do relatively quickly. Uh, oops, not that. <laughs> um, okay. Timo, if you can see that, I'm assuming everyone else can. I can see that. Excellent. That's a good start. Um, so I guess... Uh, Timo and I haven't actually met Fernando yet. Uh, we were discussing earlier whose um, exhibition this um, series of talks goes alongside and we feel like that's probably worth acknowledging too because um, the project that we're working on here has to do with um, us trying to process how we feel about being in the world at the moment and so it's a fairly weird time and knowing that Sydney has just gone into a kind of fairly full-on two-week lockdown, uh, it's worth acknowledging that um, we would love to be at the exhibition, we'd love to be there with Fernando and we would much prefer to be talking to other people in person than um, talking as heads on screens, but here we are. Um, but I suppose also this is not totally inappropriate because this project actually started when Timo was in New York and I was in Sydney. Um, and we started the project as a conversation uh, through post and through email as a way for us to continue conversations that we'd started when we were both doctoral students um, at UTS a long time ago now, um, probably around 2006. Um, and uh, Timo and I met in a shared research space there. We were both working in the postgrad room and realised that we both had this uh, kind of similar dark sense of humour and we were both really into birds. <laughs> so Timo had always been a bird uh, and I just liked drawing them. Um, and Timo got a full-time position at UTS and moved out of the research room and into his own office and I missed him. Uh, so every day at three o'clock, I would draw a picture of a bird with a smutty name. Um, there were lots of boobies and tits, and I'd draw it on a post-it note and leave it on his office door. 
So that's how we started <laughs> having conversations about birds when we weren't in each other's presence. Um, and by the way, I, I still have all of those posters. They've been there a lot. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so there was also a book that um, had inspired this project, which is called I Send You This Cadmium Red. And it's a series of um, letters back and forth between uh, John Berger and John Christie talking about life and art. And um, we really liked the idea of having a conversation by post, but also by making things for each other. And so one of the first things um, that was sent, um, Timo made me a cross-stitch poem um, and I think it was the passenger pigeon one. Yeah. And uh, so this was in um, uh, in 2018. I, I I was teaching a class at Parsons in New York called Sustainable Systems, and and um, and in that class, undergraduate students are introduced to both systems thinking, but also um, the world around them um, and their their sort of role in the world and. And I talked about the passenger pigeon because it, it was a bird that was found in New York once upon a time. Um, these massive flocks of this pigeon uh, would cloud the sky for uh, hours and sometimes for days on end. Um, there's estimated anywhere between five to seven billion of those birds to have existed. And within 50 years, they were hunted to extinction um, during the 1800s. And, um, and I was shocked... Uh, and this was the, the shock was really what prompted that short poem that I crossed it for Zoe. Uh, none of the 18 students in the class had ever heard of the passenger pigeon. And that was to me a kind of a, a wake up moment, how we could go from what some people have estimated to have been the most numerous bird on the planet, uh, which then went extinct. And then a hundred years later, nobody not even knowing uh, where that bird had existed about its existence. And um, and so I guess that shot prompted the poem. Um, and, um, and that then, I think that was actually before the project formally started, Zoe. Yeah. Um, Might be in part why it did start. Yeah. So do you want to maybe talk through the structure, the initial structure of the project that we no longer follow? <laughs> yeah, so we had this, um, I like to make rules. And um, so we made this rule where uh, once a month we would set each other, we'd choose a bird for each other from um, the IUCN red list, which is um, a list of uh the conservation status of, of different species. And we would choose a bird that was somewhere between critically endangered and extinct, just in that, like the kind of red zone. Um, and we used the alphabet. So starting the first month, we started with birds whose Latin names began with the letter A, B, and we we're going to move through the whole alphabet. And um, we liked the symmetry of it because um, between us, we were going to end up with a set of uh, 52 birds, one for each week of the year. It just, it sort of, uh, on paper, it made a lot of sense. Um, the reality of that was that I think we got to about J <laughs> uh, and we realised that as two people who were working full-time with like kind of uh, teaching and research loads, producing an artwork a month um, about uh, a precarious bird was not only time-consuming and difficult but also quite depressing um, so we slowed down a little bit, but we'll get to that when we get to the residency. Um, but I, I guess the thing was we didn't, there were no, there were rules about the structure of the, the conversation, I guess, but um, we sent all sorts of different things to each other, um, postcards and, you know, Timo's cross-stitch poems and my drawings, and I even sent you a, pass, a carrier pigeon message once. Yes, you did. <laughs> um, and so I guess what we realised was that what we, were, what we were doing with this is using birds as an index, so markers that point to the ecological, cultural and ethical dimensions of the extinction crisis more broadly. Um, and in having this conversation, I don't think we, we knew at the beginning what we were doing. We just knew that we wanted someone to talk to about this, but also we wanted to figure out what we could do um, as artists, as designers, um, as educators, how we could do something about this. And one way that we think and process um, 
our experience in the world is through making. So we decided to start this conversation through making. And I think one thing that emerged, um, Timo, was this idea of shifting baseline syndrome. Do you want to talk to that? Yeah, and the, the, the example, and by the way, I'm really thrilled that the caravans behind you are also joining the conversation. <laughs> They're really loud. <laughs> I, I love when that happens. We might get some noisy miners on the on the line to start type later. Um, they sometimes like to join us. Um, but yeah, shifting baseline syndrome is basically like that example of the students um, earlier is, is one sort of lived example of that where um, we we start to collectively forget what was once here, and um, and so we have two definitions here of of what that shifting baseline syndrome is. So Soga and Gaston call it a gradual change in the accepted norms for the condition of the natural environment due to a lack of lack of experience, memory, and or knowledge of its past condition. And then Khan called it an environmental generational amnesia, and it really is that. So um, in the case of New York and those students. Um, none of them knowing about the passenger pigeon, even though about 150 years earlier, it would have been one of the most numerous birds in the state of New York. And so that's the kind of the, the question that we keep coming back to as well. What can we as designers do about this phenomenon that is all around us? Because collectively, um, humanity, we are, I would say, to some extent, choosing to forget what we are losing on a daily basis um, because things are disappearing from all around us on a on a daily basis and um, much of the time we're just not paying paying attention to it and I think at least to some extent it's by choice. Yeah another example of shifting baseline syndrome that's um, cited a lot is the idea that um, people who are our age and older remember going on long car trips and having to stop the car to clear the insects off, like the number of bugs that would hit the windshield would build up to the point that your wipers wouldn't work anymore. But very few children today have had that experience and that sense of like, oh, it used to be different. Um, and I guess the, the problem that that has is not just about uh, having a kind of nostalgia for the nature that once was, it's also a problem for conservation where when we continually shift the baseline, when we continually remember what is happening now as normal, the our ability to understand how much we need to preserve and what is missing on a kind of broader scale is really um, uh, is really crucial for people to understand how important conservation is. Um, and so, I guess the the idea of shifting eco-amnesia or trying to do something to make people aware of what is being lost or remember what has been lost is not uncommon. I think that there are quite a lot of, um, art, well, we know that there are a lot of artists and designers and, I mean, uh, Fernando's exhibition is a beautiful example of that where he is um, paying attention to a bird a day and um, documenting that through his painting practice. Um, th there are There are kind of um, numerous examples of this, but one that we like to talk to a bit, and Timo, I'm going to give this to you. Is, um, is uh, Chris Jordan's uh, film Albatross. So uh, Chris Jordan is an American photographer. That I've, I've followed his work for over a decade now because the image that you see here is, is I think, from around 2009. And I, I remember when I saw it, I it registered within seconds for me, what I was looking at, um, and um, and it's basically what, what you see in the image is is an albat albatross chick from an island called Midway, which is part of the Hawaiian Islands, and um, and Jordan has spent uh, years on Midway documenting um, this phenomenon where um, albatross parents, um, when they're feeding their chick, they can't distinguish between squid and fish that they would normally pick from the surface of the ocean and plastic that is floating on the ocean. So they often pick up plastic bits of plastic um, and they feed it to their chicks. And um, and some chicks um, are able to um, uh, basically vomit the plastic out um, and, and survive. Um, and, um, and, and then unfortunately some um, are not able to, and this is what you see, they literally kind of just, um, that, well, they die because they can't die, they don't have, 
they lose the capacity to digest um, food because there there is literally no space for them to do that, and um, and they they kind of starve to death. Um, and um, and uh, the film Albatross came out in 2017. It was released online for free, so anyone um, who wants to watch it, and I highly, well, we both highly recommend that you do watch it. But in the film. Um, uh, Jordan says, I believe in facing the dark realities of our time, summoning the courage to not turn away, not as an exercise in pain or punishment or to make us feel bad about ourselves, but because in this act of witnessing, a doorway opens. And for us, this this um, quote from Jordan is really powerful because this, this project is not an easy one. Um, it, there are times when it gets overwhelming, um, when you sort of, Dealing with with uh, um, the very concrete losses, and and you know, last year was one example when the fires um, ravaged so much of Eastern Australia and, and also quite parts of Western Australia. Um, and um, actually, on the project website, on the blog, we have a uh, um, photographs that were taken in Malakuda um, by someone um, of birds that had been. Um, Killed by the fires, they they um, they washed up on on a beach um, in the days following the fires. But um, but it, it's it, it's a very sort of um, it, it hits you hard when you look at those images. Like the the losses hit you hard, and um, and so so nonetheless, I think that this that there is power in in the way that Jordan talks about. Um, you know the opportunity that is is there for all of us to to actually take responsibility and and um and to to sort of say that yeah this is something that I'm going to now care about and and do something about and um and that's I guess why we're also here today. Mm. Um, and I think so. I guess that leads into us having a. a as designers but also as researchers, having a, a question that started this, and it's not really a research question, but I guess it's a motivation, which is can we as designers address the shifting baseline syndrome of avian or any extinctions? So rather than looking on and bearing witness with grief, what can we do? And, uh, I mean, I think that we're not science scientists we're not conservation scientists we you know we could go tree planting we can uh donate to um all of the great organizer organizations out there who are supporting conservation um, and restoration efforts but what else can we do um so I guess what we're trying to do is think through the moral and ethical responsibilities in a time of ecological crisis and Im invite others through our work to join into these conversations. So the project itself is about making time and space to think through deliberately slow processes um, in our work, so through drawing and cross-stitch and collage and writing, um, as well as having conversations with others. Um, and so um, slowness is a really important part of our process in this project, um, as is having conversations with other people. Yeah, and... Um Sorry, um, um, move on to the next one. Yeah. Yes, I'm just having a little bit. <laughs> um, so, um, it, so the project started around March 2018, and by um, November 2019, so about 18 months into the project, we were actually able to meet up physically. Um, so, um, Zoe. Uh, got PEP or a, a type of a research lead from UTS and was able to come to New York. And um, initially, we did exactly what you, I think both the images are me, um, the, on the left at the American um, Natural History Museum and on the right in Central Park, they were taken on the same day. Um, I actually remember the day very clearly because we both had a pretty... Um, emotional experience at the museum, particularly when we saw the passenger pigeons, um, which there were several of in the display. And and so there, there's something incredibly real about the loss 
when you just see these taxidermied birds that you know 150 years earlier um, could have been flying uh, literally just outside. Um, and yeah, the I don't know if, how it was for you, Zoe, but I, I remember in advance thinking like we're going to have this great day at the museum and <laughs> really productive and we pretty much walked out crying or close to it. Yeah. And, um, but then went to Central Park and, and um, actually did some just bird watching, which in, in the winter in, in New York is amazing because a lot of the ducks um, from uh, further north in North America actually migrate south and some, of, some end up wintering in Central Park. So there were all kinds of, um, there's mergenses and uh, buffalo heads and um, shovelers. There's, there's this incredible diversity of ducks um, at the reservoir that you see here. And, um, and also I, I was thinking about this the other day, like this was less than three months before the pandemic started. Like it, it's like, these were like, not that I knew it at the time, but these were like the last months of, of any kind of familiar life um, as I'd known it for a decade in New York. Um, that would then end at the beginning of March. But, um, but, but yeah, this is a good example of, of as I talked just earlier about slowing down, um, to, to, this day was very much about just taking things slowly, walking and talking and observing um, and, and taking quiet time to, to observe birds as well as squirrels. <laughs> <We're not gonna laughs> no, the squirrel videos, but there were a lot of uh, videos of squirrels made on the day. <laughs> I mean, I also, I, we'll, we'll talk about the residents at, uh, residency that we went to in a second, but it, this was just before um, the kind of the main lockdown started to happen. But it was also for me, um, I went on this trip um, to New York and then to Avril Park and I flew back into Sydney. I'd been gone for a month. I flew back in and I'd completely missed the bushfires. Um, so I flew back in and the sky was red and I couldn't breathe and it was like coming into Mars. It was the most uncanny experience for me. And I suppose this is worth talking about because at, at, at this point when I came to see you um, in New York and when we were working on this, the Precarious Birds Project was like a little kind of side I guess it was a little side hustle and I was thinking of it as um, something that we did um, in conversation with each other, um, not so much as a, an outward or a more public conversation. And then because of what happened in the world around us, because we'd spent this time um, slowing down and working through some of our conversations around this and at, at the residency, as we'll show in a second, um, we, I, I, in particular, really started to value this work that we were doing in this project in a way that I hadn't before. And since that time, this has actually become a much more significant project for both of us, I think. Um, so this was the residency at Arts, Letters and Numbers, um, which is in Avril Park in upstate New York, and it was snowing, which was very exciting for me, um, probably less for Timo being from Finland and living in New York for a long time, but I was really excited about the snow. Um, but we spent this incredible week there, um, and the picture below, the snow picture, is um, a very small part of the enormous room that we had um, there was also a grand piano behind us there, which we propped a laptop on to play to play music through. Um, but it was this incredible experience where we were in this um, in this house in this small town, and we just got to work on this project for a week. Um, the main picture there is a little ante room that's off the big room that you can also see, and we set up a little. Um, exhibition space, I guess, of the work we were doing at the time and the planning and talking through. Um, and um, it was just, it was a really incredible time. We were just working near each other and there's something to be said for that, I think, for, for us having a conversation. It's not just talking, it's also just being in proximity and we listened to podcasts and um, we read things to each other and we talked um, and we talked to other people in the community. We were there for Thanksgiving. Um, again, very novel for me. Um, and at that 
um, Thanksgiving, we were sitting amongst all of these people from this town who some of whom were academics, but they were um, physicists and botanists. Um, and Olga, who was on the residency with us, um, uh, is a, a Polish sculptor who was there doing large drawings. And um, it was just, it was quite an incredible experience. And there was something about being around people who weren't designers, who weren't design researchers and talking about this work um, that really opened up the potential of this project for me when I realised that we could actually have something to say to people outside of our area. Yeah. Um, I also just, I'm just sort of went on a sidetrack Um I just want to acknowledge that it is uh, in many parts of the world pride is being celebrated today and and um looking at that photo of of the Thanksgiving dinner the woman who sat next to me turned out to be a gay woman and a botanist and I thought of course <laughs> of course she is sitting next to me like that was meant to be and um, <laughs> and um uh, it, it's it's Liz and and she was really great because she's actually a botanist as as Zoe said um and knows upstate New York ecology really well. So it was really great to have have conversations with her because this was also a place where those passenger pigeons would have been seen in millions um, 150 years earlier. Um, I took a number of times just looking at the sky um, at Avril Park and, and trying to imagine what it might have been like to see those millions and millions of birds um, flying over. And um, um, we did see the International Space Station there. Yeah, um, <laughs> that was also a highlight for me. <laughs> and um, and yeah, it was uh, it was really just an incredible week to um, to to be able to work on on this intensely and connect with these ideas on quite intensely. And I think as well, it was at that point where we, you know, in person, um, we managed to discuss the scope of the project was too large um, and that doing 52 birds, um, which seems funny because Fernando's obviously doing um, a bird a, um, a, a bird a day. Um, but I guess what we what we decided was that we would try and perhaps whittle it down because we're also doing, uh, other than um, our, our own artworks, we're also doing interviews and doing a lot of kind of reading and writing around each bird species. And this is the idea of the birds being a kind of index to bigger um, ecological issues and human entanglement with what's going on in the, the ecosystems that these birds live within. And so we wanted to be able to have fewer birds but spend more time with them. So we whittled our list down to six birds each, so having 12 birds. Um, and then, Timo, you came back to Australia. Yeah, so um, actually while we were at the residency, I was already um, in conversations with UTS um, and um, I think I ended up signing my contract about a week after, after the residency um, with the view of coming back in June, uh, which then got delayed by about a month because of the pandemic, so I ended up arriving in July. But, but nonetheless, that, that was, um, um, for this project, a really exciting change because um, we were then able to actually work together in person. And what we ended up doing, I think in the first six months, we met weekly, I think, um, or certainly. Um, and, and even now we meet every two weeks. Like we just have a standing, standing session every two weeks to, to work on the project, whatever it needs working on. But I, um, one of the things that we listened to um, at the residency was the, uh, we listened to one of the chapters from Braiding Sweetgrass, which is a, a wonderful book by Robin Wall Kimmerer. I highly recommend it to anyone and everyone, regardless of your field. Um, uh, Kimmerer is a, a, a Native American botanist. Um, and she's a member of the Potawatomi Nation and, and knows... Um, <sighs> She she has an understanding of of um, the sort of Eastern North America through these different lenses. Like she has the lens of a a, a scientist. Um, you know, she is a botanist by by training, but she also has her own cultural knowledge and 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 worldview of 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 that world. And 
and she weaves it weaves those different worldviews together really beautifully in in writing sweet grass. She also has another book called Gathering Moss, which I, I highly recommend. Um, but in the book, uh, there's, there's a chapter where she talks about a study um, that she does with some of her students. Um, and and they're actually they're looking at um, newts, which are a small amphibian that lives in the forest, um, that in the spring have to migrate from where they've hibernated to the ponds where they will uh, spawn. Um, and um, and they have to cross roads. And in one of these studies, she and her students, they basically count the number of newts, or salamanders rather, um, that get um, hit by cars, killed, killed by cars. And they, they're not, because they have to be these detached scientists, they don't do anything to stop this from happening. They literally just count the number of um, salamanders that are getting killed which is incredibly traumatic for, for the students and for her. Um, but in, in, in the book, she, she writes, weep, weep, causes a toad from the water's edge. And I do. If grief can be a doorway to love, then let us all weep for the world we're breaking apart so we can love it back to wholeness again. Um, and um, this image that you see here, I actually took this um, just a few months ago um, down south, um, in a place called Manana. Um, it's actually a hooded plover, uh, which is a, a, an endangered species in New South, New South Wales. Uh, we're down to about 40 to 50 individuals of these birds in New South Wales um, because they are a beach nesting bird and, um, and various activities that we do on beaches um, are a threat to these birds. And, and so just to see one, it's like it was just a really ordinary moment um, coming across this bird and and um and realizing what it was and just being absolutely blown away that he is one of the 40 or 50 in New South Wales that I'm I'm having an encounter with and um and and yeah um I, I think the project has also made us more aware of just the importance of noticing and paying attention to to the world around us on a daily basis. Um, wouldn't you say as always yeah, look, absolutely. I think that um, noticing, I mean, one of the other um, texts that we looked at a lot at the residency is a book called Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet. Um, and Anna Singh is one of the editors of that book. And she writes a lot about the arts of noticing and the importance of noticing. And I think that it is something that um, has been really interesting for me over the project because you've always been a birder or you've been a birder since you were really little um, and I, I haven't in the same way. I've always liked birds. I like drawing them more. <laughs> um, but I haven't been, um, I, I guess I haven't been a naturalist. I haven't been um, someone who goes out in nature and actually observes things with any kind of um, system to it. Um, but since starting the project I have it's changed the way I think about how I am in the world and how I move through the world, and I really like that. Um, one of the other things that happened when Timo got back to Sydney was we realised we had a couple of Australian birds in our 12, but when we chose those 12 birds that we were going to focus on, um, we weren't really thinking of um, having a local location because, you know, we were, we were having this dialogue across different continents. Um, so when we... Where we decided we'd think about is there a local bird that we could um, that we could bring into this project and start focusing on. Um, and Timo actually suggested a short list of birds, and um, I fell in love with the Regent Honey Eater because it's a really beautiful bird. Um, and so we decided to have a thirteenth bird because that felt lucky, um, and we chose the Regent Honey Eater. So. Yeah, and um, and I mean the 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 story of the Regent Honey Eater is um, it, it in some ways I, I see some moments of connection with my time in Australia. I um, as I mentioned, I I've been a bird watcher since I was a kid. My dad got me interested in in birds. Moikka is a yoskatsot tällä hetkellä, and um, 
And I got my first um, bird, Australian bird guide book not long after I moved here in 96. And, um, and it's a book that came out in 1980. And the map that you see on the left is the, is the distribution of the region honey eater in the 19, actually in the 1970s. But you can see that it spans from South, South Australia, roughly from around Adelaide, uh, all the way to sort of southern Queensland. And then um, in a more recent edition, I think it's the eighth edition on the right, um, the bird is no longer, excuse me, the bird is no longer um, found in South Australia and even the range in Queensland has contracted. And, um, and you know, the thing to also get with these images, we are now down to, I mean, the optimistic estimates say that there might be as many as 450 birds uh, left in the wild. Uh, the, the more pessimistic uh, estimates say that there's as few as 150 birds left. So that blob of colour that you see on the map of Australia, like how do you make that represent 150 birds or 450 birds? Like it, it doesn't actually tell the full story of of this um, incredibly endangered bird. And and just to be clear, um, the bird is endangered because um, we have. Uh, destroyed most of its habitat. It, it requires certain types of woodland um, that has um, a year-round supply of nectar, and um, and and we have converted a lot of lot of that woodland to agriculture and other other um, uh, also some of it to mining, and um, and so habitat loss is the thing that has driven the the sort of catastrophic decline of this bird because it was in the 1960s up to the 1960s it was still um considered to be um relatively common and um and it's now literally one of the rarest birds on this continent there's one <laughs> um, <laughs> so taronga zoo um or taronga conservation has um, a breeding program and so um Thibaut and I have been going to visit the birds at Taronga once a month. Um, so I think we've made, is it six or seven trips now? I can't remember. Okay. Um, but there's a, uh, in the Blue Mountains Bush Walk, um, also known as the Wallamai Pine um, exhibit, there are eight birds that are just flying around. Um, you can walk in and they will fly actually alarmingly close to your head. <laughs> um, and there's there's been something I guess kind of incredible incredibly magical about having one of the birds that we're looking at in this project be accessible to us um, and we've talked a few times about um, the kind of awe and excitement of um, when we first went to visit the the birds at the zoo um, realizing that they were actually flying around us I think um, we'd expected them to be behind something yeah and, um, and not be at the risk of um, being pooped on by them yes <laughs> which was almost <laughs> a <really laughs> dramatic start to that, <laughs> that first visit um i would also like to um point out that there's um in the picture where you can see um timo standing quite still and looking at um a, a bird there um do you want to talk about john travolta yes so um uh the bird that you see there is a, um, a masked lapwing, um, often referred to as a plover. In fact, I've heard two people at the zoo so far call it a bloody plover, not zoo staff, um, visitors to the zoo. Um, um, we recently discovered that um, he it's actually a she, but her name is John Travolta, um, named by the zoo staff. So um, she is there every time we visit. And um, I am fairly certain that by now she knows us because um, I, in fact, think that most of the birds in the enclosure know us by now because we spend quite a long time each visit in the enclosure and we talk both to the birds and to each other so they would recognise our voices as well and, um, and they're pretty comfortable around us. Yeah, we, I mean, we have spent some time talking to humans at the zoo too. We've had um, <laughs> we've had conversations with some of the conservation team there, but it's also um, it's been really nice in our visits when we're there. Often the 
Taronga volunteers who move through the space will come over and have a chat to us and, you know, we're drawing and taking notes and um, it, it's been really nice feeling um, able to go and visit these birds but also watching other people have relationships with them and care for them um, in a really particular way. But um, the first piece that we did for um, Fernando's Reader is um, – a, a kind of tra an edited transcription of um, one of our uh, of our first visit to go and see the Regent Honey Eaters, and so it's a conversation between us um, about our project and about the Honey Eaters, and um, just talking through, I guess, some of the issues with this bird, but also drawing ourselves into it. And I suppose that's to to wrap round to where we started with um, one of the things that we wanted to know is what 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 might we as designers have to offer um, in this in this moment rather than talking about our grief, um, what could we bring to the conservation story? And I suppose it's a particular type of storytelling and a particular way of being, um, staying with the trouble, to quote Donna Haraway. Um, and this is the first of a series that we're hoping to do for Fernando and his exhibition. Yeah. Um, and then there, there are sort of physical artifacts that we're both making. So we we both um, are makers as well. And so um, making is one way to engage with, with something. And, and for me, it's, it's cross-stitch. Uh, Zoe will in a moment talk about her approach. But so uh, for each of the species, I am doing a cross-stitch. I've finished some. Um, I have... The, an earlier species is the laser and duck. Um, it's probably about halfway through. Um, you know, these pieces, the laser and duck, I think will be about 80 hours of stitching by the time I'm finished with it. So some of them take quite long. The region honey eater will take a little bit less. Um, uh, it's um, it's going to be, I'm doing it roughly life size, so it'll be about maybe 18 centimetres by about 10 centimetres, so it won't take that long. But um, but it's one way to, I mean, th there is something in that sort of um, slow and reflective um, mode of doing something that is also really important to this project. Um, and Zoe, do you want to maybe talk about your... Yeah. So this is, um, this is actually a collaboration, this piece, um, and it's um, a bird box about the Regent Honey Eater. It's an augmented bird box. Um, and the so I, I created the illustrations and I'll talk about the process in a minute, but it's got layers to it and each layer represents some of the, the kind of issues with the bird. And you can't, I've actually included an image that's on an angle, but there's, um, there's the iron bark eucalypt, which is the habitat that needs to be around if these birds are going to um, continue to exist and it needs to be around in kind of continuous strips. One of the issues is that there are now only patches of habitat for this bird, so it can't move back and forth across its range. Um, and there's also, there's a possum in there. You can sort of see it in the top image um, coming down to um, eat some of the um, eggs and fledglings. So it's it's trying to bring some of the story around what's going on with the Regent Honey Eater into um, a kind of uh, visual and material form. And our colleague Andrew Burrell has um, created a, a, an augmented reality layer of storytelling. So you activate it with your phone and um, from the front angle um, there is a really beautiful first-person narrative that's been written by Tom Van Doren about um, his understanding of the Regent Honey Eater as a species um, living in the Blue Mountains just around the time of the bushfires and speculating what will have happened um, after the 2019-20 fires to this species. Um, and there's another audio piece that you hear from the back and you can see there that kind of incredible disco layering is... Um, uh, a piece of work done by Katie Dean where she made the images um, just using some of the, um, the, the found images of Regent Honey Eaters. Um, and the audio from the back is actually uh, Timo and I in conversation about visiting the birds at the zoo and what's happening with the conservation efforts there. Um, and each layer of that um, bird box has been made. I, I draw from photographs, so contemporary photographs of the Regent honey eaters, um, just in pencil. 
but then I colour those images by cutting and pasting little bits out of a whole bunch of old um, natural history illustrations. So you get these kind of uncanny images where from a distance it looks like uh, maybe a traditional um, a natural science illustration, but as you get closer, you realise there's something a bit wrong with it. And so that's my way of trying to invite um, viewers to look um, a little closer and to think about the idea of representations of nature um, and how we represent the stories around these animals. Um, I think that we're at 3.45 and we did say that we would like to have questions. So yeah. should we... Open it up if Catherine you'd like to yes. jump back in. Yes, hello. I'll just jump back in here. Hi, thank hello. you. Hi. <laughs> We've just got one question at the moment. So please, if anyone else um, has any questions or comments that they'd like to ask, feel free to just pop it into the YouTube chat, which should just be under the video. Um, our first question is from Christina, who says, have you thought about the role of familiarity in valuing endangered species? Um, Great question. It is a good question. Timo, I'll start and you can jump in, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one thing about the Regent Honey Eater, and I'll admit that, like, when we looked at the list of birds, local birds that we could look at, um, one thing I was attracted to about this bird is that it's incredibly beautiful and visually it's really striking. And so it's easy to choose something like this. Um, and it's easy to make something like a Regent honey eater into a kind of um, like a poster bird for, for this movement. And I think one of the more difficult things is how do you actually get people to understand that um, lice and ants and worms and you know things that we perceive as perhaps less beautiful or less cute how do you actually get things that people don't look at all the time so I guess part of what we're trying to do in some of the um, the writing and um, the narration like what we're doing now when we talk about this work is to get people to understand that it's not just about the individual species but it's about all of the things within an ecosystem um, which I don't think we've covered very well today, but it's that's a di sort of different conversation. But, yeah, familiarity, I think, is really important. Yeah, and because it's it's in some ways very difficult for people to care about something that they might not know about, and if they know about it, if it's like, for example, one of the species that, that Zoe assigned to me early on in the project is uh, little birds in the Andes in, in, in Colombia. Um, called the Munchik wood wren. Um, and I mean, I'd never heard of the bird before this project. Um, and, and in some ways, like, I, them, there might be people in, in Colombia who very much care about the woodlands in which this is a very specific type of woodland that this bird exists in. But, you know, it, I can see why for a lot of people, like, there are so many other things to worry about on a daily basis that caring about this little bird in the Andes might be quite difficult um, to sort of fit in because um, it was pretty difficult for me to fit it into, into my sort of world. But, um, but, but I think certainly when it comes to like, our, and, and, and that's where the region honey eater is so important because it is, um, you know, this is a bird that was regularly seen in Sydney. Like you could actually, um, see them certainly sort of in the outer suburbs um, 50 years ago um, relatively regularly. They, there are still instances, I think, sometimes when when an individual might stray into Sydney, but it's pretty rare because there are so few of them. But, um, but that's, I think, you know, maybe the question is, like, what would it take for this species to be familiar again to Sydney ciders, such that we might care about it um, enough to make changes that that the remaining habitat is is preserved and new habitat is is created by restoring um, some of the areas where those woodlands used to exist by um, by replanting and, and and so forth. And, and it's important to remember that that work is it takes decades. Like you. Um, from the time that the trees are planted, like it's probably at least two or three decades before that habitat starts to be of a quality that it supports these birds. But um, some of that work is happening now, but we also need to actually just stop um, 
all of the activities that are um, threatening the remaining habitats of this bird. Mm. I suppose another way of answering this, that question too, and this is to give a plug to a, a different project that's sort of attached this as well, is um, a project that I'm also part of called the Urban Field Naturalist Project. And the aim of that is to try and get um, people who live in cities, really, urban areas, to stop thinking about nature as something that we go and see on the weekend when we go for a bushwalk or when you go for an ocean swim, you might come across nature to start thinking about the things that are around us all of the time, that we are actually in nature and that what's going on in our garden or on our balcony or in our local park is actually really important for us to notice and become familiar with. And so this, um, the, the bird box that um, Andrew Burrell and I have created is actually part of an exhibition that um, we have curated at the UTS Library at the moment, uh, which if you're in Sydney, you can't go and see, <laughs> just as you can't go and see Fernando's exhibition, unfortunately. Um, but th I think that we and other um, designers and artists and curators are trying to answer that question through the work we're doing at the moment, which is um, not just um, how do we make these things more familiar, but how do we bring them into people's daily lives and conversations? How can we get people to talk about this stuff? Because if we're talking about it, then when, you know, we're noticing, we're making decisions, it's in the back of our minds when we make decisions about how we want to vote, um, how we want to shop, how we want to be in the world. So, I mean, it's a, it's such a good question, but it's also a really difficult question to answer. Yeah, it, I agree. It's an excellent question and very difficult one and, and one that we, I think, should sit with yeah. on a regular basis. I mean, not just yeah. the two of us, but everyone. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I thank you for the question because I'd never kind of considered familiarity as a, mm. a thing in this. So it, it definitely opens up some new avenues for us. Wonderful. Thank you so much for um, answering. That was a fantastic answer as well. Um, we haven't had any further questions. Was there anything that either of you wanted to touch on before we wrap up today? No, but I, I think both like our parents are watching. So like, come on, come on, mum. Uh <laughs> <laughs> <Or maybe. laughs> um, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I suppose, um, I guess, Catherine, can I ask you a question? <laughs> sure, of course. Um, how are you curating work like this, like Fernando's exhibition? Um, how, like are you seeing more of this coming through? What, what's going on? What's people's reaction to it? Um, yeah, it's been really fantastic having this show, especially for all the students that have been coming through. Um, and kind of this idea of slowness um, is really coming through in that work as well. Um, I think especially as well the pandemic has kind of made everybody <laughs> slow down and engage with the world differently um, and to kind of actually sit with ourselves and think about, you know, what is here immediately, what is familiar and what kind of have we been ignoring um, in kind of the hustle and bustle of the usual world. So, yeah, it's interesting to have those students come through um, and kind of experience those works in that way. Mm. Right. I mean, I think for me, the, the connection between, so when I came back after the residency, when I got back to Australia, and as I said, I kind of arrived and it was like I was on Mars and there's a term, um, solastalgia, mm. which um, refers to the idea of feeling homesick at home mm. when your home has changed so significantly that you suddenly have a kind of a yearning or a nostalgia for how it once was. Mm -hmm. And the thing at that point, I started that teaching year thinking we were going to be talking about um, extinction, about conservation, about um, climate change and the climate crisis and the precarity of our environment. Um, and then two weeks into teaching semester, the pandemic shut, shut the world down and all of a sudden no one was talking about um, kind of the environment in terms of climate change and conservation. They were talking about mm. this kind of you know, this pandemic that no one really saw coming, which is alarming. But the thing with both of those is that all of a sudden um, what what is very invisible in the world, these kind of enormous phenomena that are happening on are all around us became very visible. Mm. We suddenly realised that the air we breathe and the things that we touch and then touch our face and 
that was suddenly very visceral. And I think for people who lived in Sydney and the Blue Mountains in particular after um, the bushfires, the, the idea that suddenly air, which was normally invisible, was really visible. There were particles that we were hearing about that we hadn't heard about before. So that kind of the idea of our breath becoming really important and connecting us to everyone around us. How do we start to visualise those things and how do we start to understand them as connecting us to everything around us? Mm. And that is, that's why I think people are turning to, to art and design now as a way of kind of visualising and materialising some of this stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. And what I really love about um, Fernando's project as well is kind of how open-ended it is. And that kind of came into the, you know, the curation of the work, which Fernando was really kind of leading the display um, along with my colleague Tim Silver as well. Um, and the way that he kind of presented it was quite intuitive in the same way that that particular project was, um, you know, not necessarily depicting every single bird that he's viewed over a time period, but kind of what the atmosphere experience or the perception of those birds were um mm. so it's interesting that it is that you know 365 daily bird list that is ongoing so there's only you know about 88 um in this particular exhibition and you know maybe there will be different iterations to present that project in the future as well and I think that kind of open-endedness and look towards the future and that you know things that are changing is reflected really nicely there as well we just had um, another question come through um, from Nicole. She says, do you think there is a way to engage the commercial industry to use their visibility as a way to use beauty as leverage for change and awareness? Um, yes. I mean, there are, there are examples of that having been done successfully, and I'm desperately now trying to think one, but I, I, have, I, I know sort of if more broadly in the conservation space, there have been some great examples of of um, of that because often these um, you know whilst we might be focusing on a on a single species, it is connected to a whole whole system, whole ecosystem. And um, and in the case of the region, honey, I mean, we are talking about the Hunter Valley. We are talking about Capiti Valley, a uh, number of places in Victoria, but they are you know. Um, also viewed as travel destinations. And so um, there's been instances at, um, where some of the proposed developments in the Hunter Valley, for example, which threaten the region honey eater, are also seen as a threat to the tourism industry. And so um, interestingly, there's been some support um, uh, or, or opposition to the development projects from the local community because it's seen not as a threat so much to um, to the region honey either, but to businesses that rely on on um, you know that area remaining attractive to other humans, such that they come there to visit. Because um, if you, for example, if you do an open coal mine, um, there's an immediate. I mean, there's a, a, a clearance of land, but there's also a decrease in air quality because you will have um, uh, particles in the air from from the mining and and um and so there are instances where these go hand hand in hand together and and from what I can see there's a bit of a push in Queensland now to engage tourism business around the protection of the reef um, because it's you know one figure I've seen is that sixty thousand jobs are tied to the reef um, primarily in tourism and 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 so. The loss of the reef would also mean a loss of a lot of those jobs, and um, and so, you know, it, it is important to see that all business um, actually exists on this place that we call Earth, and whether uh, politicians and business leaders want to acknowledge it, all business activity depends on the health of this planet ultimately, and so. Um, there are many business leaders who know that and understand that and act accordingly, um, and I hope that others will come come along. But but to think that business can exist with that or or by disregarding um, planetary health um, is not something that we can move forward with. Um, I, my work is in fashion um, for the most part, um, and um, 
and that's where it's particularly prevalent. Like that, that, that there are fashion businesses operating as if if the planet was just this endless source of stuff, and um, and there are limits, and um, and we've hit many of those limits, and. And yeah, that's a choice that we collectively also have to make is, is do we want to acknowledge the, the limits of this amazing planet and start to live according to those limits? Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm choosing to be optimistic. <laughs> Fernando's just popped into the conversation as well and he's asking if you could chat a little bit more about looking and listening um, and how you're thinking about design strategies for people to notice bird companions more. Um, and he's also mentioning um, the Centennial Park bird watching walk, which was scheduled for next week, um, was one of the most popular programs. Um, and he's saying, I think that's because people are looking for ways to notice nature, but sometimes don't know where to start. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose, um, again, like a cheat answer is the, the Urban Field Naturalist Project is is actually about that, trying to give people a way, like we've got some resources up there of how to get people to engage with nature. But I think um, the, there, there are bird watching walks and kind of nature walks in, in all, like in all of the parks in Sydney and in a lot of communities as well. But I think like at the moment, all of us for the next two weeks, we're allowed to have an hour of exercise a day. So, I mean, I think people with kids know you need to do something other than just go for a walk. And so taking taking your kids out or when you're walking your dog, looking for birds is just, it's like gamifying your exercise, but also making you aware of what's going on in nature. And I think just, just starting, like, I mean, I'm a total amateur and um, Tim has taught me most of the things that I know about birds, but just going out and looking, and, which is alarming, <laughs> but just going out and, and starting somewhere. And, I mean, I think what Fernando's done is amazing with, like, having a list but then doing something with the list, um, photographing, joining Facebook or Instagram groups where you can upload your stuff so you feel like you're sharing. I mean, whatever it takes to make you engage in these things. I think there's a lot of citizen science projects that are great if you're interested in um, learning more about birds, like Big City Birds is one that you can join, um, iNaturalist. There are a lot of resources out there that will help you go out into nature and start to learn as you go, and it's hard as an adult. Yeah. And and just recognising, like, us being part of this planet because I think that there is this artificial sort of um, human nature divide. You could also say there's a kind of a weird nature culture divide and, um, and, and that divide I think gets in the way a lot of the time. We don't see ourselves as being part of uh, the rest of life on this planet and, um, and just finding your way back in. Um, I mean, I, I, I may be at the extreme end because I... <laughs> I talk to the birds in Centennial Park a lot, <laughs> um, uh, including today. I went for a run this morning and, and said hello to some avian friends um, because there are some birds that I now recognise, like these are wild birds, but I run in the park often enough to recognise certain individuals. Um, so I have a, maybe an extreme <laughs> relationship in that respect. But, um, but just uh, asking yourself, like, what does, like, how am I... How am I already connected, but also what are the disconnections and, and what can I do to... I think it's even little things like just noticing your breath, paying attention to your breath um, and, and breathing. And, and so just there are all kinds of mindfulness practices that I think you can, you know, very easily look online. Just whatever opportunity you have to be outside, um, you know, I, I think, and also acknowledging... Um, and that's what I love about Fernando's work is um, we we tend to just think of all of all of inside and outside as ours. But then when you if you flip that around, like I I was at the UTS cafe um, just before this lockdown started, and a pigeon walked in, and there's you know sliding doors that open and close automatically. That pigeon knows exactly what to do. Like it it follows people who are about to go through, and it walks in when they go in. And it knows where the food is in the cafeteria. And, and people react to it like it was some accidental thing that this pigeon got in here somehow. It's like, 
if you observe that pigeon even for like 10 minutes, you know exactly, like, it's clear that the pigeon knows exactly what it's doing and, and, um, and just that, starting to pay attention to those. But that's a great point too, Timo. Like for me, because I'm not as interested in the kind of science of it, I'm not interested in like counting how many birds I see, but why I keep being interested in birds is when I look at them, I try and figure out what they're doing. And whether I'm anthropomorphizing and projecting like human qualities on it, which I do, and that's why I find them funny because they walk around with two legs but they don't have hands. Um, but watching them and watching them interact and wondering what they're doing, like what are they getting up to, that's actually a really great way to engage and having conversations, especially with children, about not just like what bird is that but what is it doing, I think is a really good way in. Mm. Yeah. We might leave it there today. Thank you so much, Timo and Zoe. That was a fantastic conversation. And thank you for everyone who tuned in and asked questions and left comments. Um, as we are in the lockdown at the moment, which has now been extended for two weeks, um, UNSW galleries will be closed temporarily, but we're very much looking forward to inviting you back when we can reopen again. Thank you for tuning in today. Thanks for having thank us. You. Thanks for having us. Okay, and we're offline.